Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidence. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Rob and I are back at it for our weekly chat. I'm coming to you live from the Doubletree Hilton in Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin, and we do a little micro geopolitics at the beginning of the episode to talk about it. If you want to talk about anything we talked about on this episode or anything else that's on your mind, like Bitcoin going to the moon or what books you should read or my latest thoughts about diet and exercise, really anything else, you can write to me at jacob at cognitive.investments. You can also find out more about the services that we offer at CI and whether those would be a fit for you or whether you want me to come to your event. As you can tell, I'm all over the place right now. So other than that, take good care of the people you love and I will see you out there. All right, well, if you're watching the video of this, you can tell I'm on the road again, and I'm back in Wisconsin for the second time in two weeks. Where are you, Rob? <laughs> well, I'm in Paris today, but this morning I was actually at the U.S. Embassy, which I guess is technically American soil, right? I guess technically. I feel like I'm always getting the short end of the straw. I'm like in random places in Wisconsin, and you're like, I'm just chilling in Paris. Like, when do I get to chill in Paris? When, when do I get to that point in my life, huh? Well, trust me, you didn't want to spend time at the U.S. Embassy. That's not a... It's not a walk in the park. We'll just say that. Well, what's what's worse, spending time at the at the U.S. Embassy in Paris or spending time at a DMV in any United States city or town? It's pretty much the same experience, except the architecture outside is much nicer. Okay. Um, well, last week we did a little talking about Eau Claire, Wisconsin, which you might have thought it was a one-off, that this micro-geopolitics theme couldn't possibly be applied to other towns. You were incorrect, because I am now in Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin, um, Pleasant Prairie is not really known at all. Um, it's honest, it doesn't even have a downtown. They're talking about putting in a downtown. Um, it was originally, or at least it has, um, it has some interesting factoids about it. It is one of the sites with sort of the earliest recorded um, Native American activity. So this area seemed to be a gathering place, place or a meeting place for a lot of Native American tribes that were in the region. At least one reason for that is that the lake used to be here it is now no more towards kenosha but apparently the the boundaries of the lake used to come up here so native americans used to sort of congregate here the other sort of claim to fame is that there's a big prairie and i hope i'm not mispronouncing it called the chiwaki prairie and it's the last unbroken stretch of prairie of its kind in wisconsin and it's home to like 400 plant species and 26 rare plants and um it's described sort of as the last bit of wisconsin landscape um, that is basically what it was like when the settlers, the English settlers and the German immigrants and all those eventually or originally got here, um, which is pretty interesting. And I also, I, I, I did like a little deep dive on the word prairie, which is an interesting word, and I won't bore you, bore you all with it. Um, but Teddy Roosevelt in his uh, How the West Was Won has this very brief little thing about prairies that I just thought I would read. He says, we have taken into our language the word prairie because when our backwoodsmen first reached the land and saw the great natural meadows of long grass, sites unknown to the gloomy forests wherein they had always dwelt, they knew not what to call them and borrowed the term already in use among the French inhabitants. Number one, that's kind of cool. Number two, we used to have U.S. presidents who could write prose like that. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, but anyway, Pleasant Prairie is basically a small town. And it goes away for a couple different reasons. Now, it's right between sort of halfway between Milwaukee and Chicago. So you can imagine everybody's either going to flock to Milwaukee or Chicago as the as the area urbanizes. But the sort of immediate cause was there was a massive explosion at the Laughlin Rand Powder Company plant, um, which made dynamite powder and things like that. Millions of pounds of dynamite exploded on March 9th, 1911, and basically leveled the entire town not just the factory, but everything. The shockwave was felt more than 500 miles away. Um, DuPont Company was the one that owned it. And it's great to read the newspaper articles about them trying to sue DuPont and the back and forth and everything else. Anyway, at that point, um, Pleasant Prairie basically um, becomes the backyard of Kenosha. And Kenosha is also an interesting town city in its own right. I, I called a friend of mine and told her I was going to be around Kenosha today and I asked what I should do and her first response was well you should probably get out because apparently Kenosha has a bad reputation um, but Kenosha has also been a center of recent political events in the United States you might remember the Jacob Blake shooting and Kyle Rittenhouse and all of that social unrest that happened in Kenosha Wisconsin um, last week we talked about Eau Claire there's a very similar story for Chrysler shutting down what was then the nation's oldest auto factory um, 
in the late 1980s as all those jobs flocked to China and other places in the world. So there's that. And then, Rob, I know that you have a, a resident uh, that you want to talk about that's in Kenosha, but do you know who the most famous son of Kenosha is? The most famous person to have come from this part of the world? No, you don't. I didn't know this either. It is Orson Welles was born in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, and this was just an excuse for me to rewatch Citizen Kane last night in my lonely hotel room and to go down an Orson Welles rabbit hole, who is also a fascinating person in and, of, in and of himself. And he apparently also had pretty divided feelings about the place. Um, so like I have a couple different quotes from him. At one point, he called himself almost belligerently Midwestern and always a confirmed badger. He also said that having returned to Kenosha, he found it vital and charming. But then he'd also said other times, I'm not ashamed of being from Wisconsin, just of being from Kenosha. It's a terrible place. Ouch. Um, and he also <laughs> he also called Kenosha in another interview, uh, let me get this right, a nasty little mid middle western city in a 1937 magazine profile. And if you don't know who Orson Welles is, he is worth the YouTube rabbit hole. He's worth watching Citizen Kane. Um, a fascinating dude in and of his own right. I'm sure you have stories you want to tell about Orson Welles too. So that's my little micro geopolitics of Kenosha. But I sent you that I wanted to do this silly little thing. And you also have some things to say about Kenosha. So let's talk about it for a second before we get into the Middle East and what's going on in the world. Well, I only bring this up because a recurring theme on the podcast has been American manufacturing and sort of Chinese outsourcing and what does the future look like for the American economy and how does that structure change? And I think this is interesting because probably if you were a stock investor, the most famous uh, inhabitant of Kenosha is Snap-on Tools. And Snap-on, I think, is, is worth talking about a little bit at least because they really exemplify what that future looks like, or I should say what it had looked like, because they are an American manufacturing company. They make pretty simple stuff and they make it all in the U.S. Wrenches, hammers, you know, all that kind of hand tools is, is all made here. And they're very profitable, extremely profitable. So how, how do they do it? How have they survived? And if you really look at it, it's, it's a fascinating story because they have survived and thrived um, in part by, and this is going to be somewhat negative on Snap-on just as a preview, but in part by embracing two sort of less savory aspects of the American economic model. The first is debt, and the second is franchising. Hmm. So if you're not too familiar with Snap-on, how it actually works, I'm sure, you, I'm sure you've seen the trucks, right? The Snap-on mm -hmm. tool vans. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're all over the place. So the reason why you see them all over the place is because Snap-on works with franchisees. Uh, the guys who drive those vans are not Snap-on employees. They're quote unquote independent contractors. So the reason why they're so aggressive in driving all over and why you see them all over the place wherever you go is because they have the whip at their back because it's a churn them and burn them kind of strategy. If you don't <clears throat> hit your sales targets, then it's set up in such a way where you're going to fail. So they get a lot of you know young male uh, guys. A lot of them are are out of military, you know, out of tech school. They want to own their own business. They like uh, tools and building stuff and fixing stuff, and they go into this area. And um, a lot of them just get churned right out after taking on a lot of debt. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect of how Snap-on's been so successful and why Snap-on is so profitable because they can sell. When Snap-on makes a sale, they're selling it not to a mechanic most of the time. They're selling it to a franchisee who they basically have under their thumb. So that's one less savory aspect of the Snap-on model. The other one is, as I mentioned, debt. So... Snap-on was one of the first American companies going all the way back to the 1920s that would, bought, that would lend you money to buy their product directly. And that continues today. Snap-on has a huge credit arm of their business. And if you really look at how their business works, Snap-on tools, you know, I think you've said recently, if we want to accept that America is going to make things, we have to accept that it's going to be much more expensive. Mm -hmm. Well... Snap-on tools are about five times as expensive as 
the equivalent. And we're talking about wrenches. Like these are not high tech, you know, high value add things. These are very simple tools. And the reason why they can do that is because the whole sale, the whole process of buying anything from Snap-on is about getting you, Mr. Mechanic, Mr. Consumer into debt. And the whole sale is not, hey, here's here's a wrench, Jacob. It's $178. It's, hey, Jacob, I'm going to give you this wrench. Just, no, no, just take it. Take it. You, you've you worked hard. You deserve it. Just pay me $8 a week for the next eight years. <laughs> and that's basically how it works. And with that customer base, you know, that is that is a pretty compelling argument because they're not thinking about the total amount of debt they're taking on. They're thinking about, hey, it's eight bucks a week for eight years for this wrench. So if you really look at the situation around Snap-on, you have this successful American manufacturing story. And I think they've done a lot of events you know, with politicians and stuff highlighting that fact. But if you peel underneath, you know, the underlying structure of that is much less healthy and much less something to be proud of than people might think. So that's well, my snap on story. Yeah, well, and it, it makes sense because when all of those auto plants shut down, um, you also, you just have a bunch of people who don't have jobs anymore. And at one point, Kenosha itself, it became a mass exporter of workers. So more than half of the people employed in Kenosha County were actually traveling to Chicago for work. Half of, a, of the fourth largest city in Wisconsin going to another city for work. And that's in the late 1980s and early 1990s. But I think if, if you're trying to find the silver lining here, it's that the Snap-on model, I think, is being eclipsed. And that this area, whether it's Kenosha or actually more specifically Pleasant Prairie, when you drive in or when you're around, there's actually a lot going on here. Now, the first thing you notice as you're driving down the highway is just massive brand new warehouses, whether it's Amazon or Uline, just absolutely brilliant, brand new. The lights are on 24-7. I can see them out from my hotel window. Um, these bigs, you know, they, they've become hubs of transportation and things like that. But for both Pleasant Prairie and Wisconsin, it's not just, so Snap-on is not the only game in town. I did a very brief search of other companies that have been building manufacturing capacity or, or you know, um, or uh, locating their operations here. One is Haribo, the candy maker. They have a huge uh, factory for creating their stuff when you come in. Siemens uh, is opening a new utility scale inverter factory in this part of the country. So they're thinking about solar and whether they can uh, translate some of their manufacturing prowess and expertise into solar, which maybe 10, 15 years ago seemed like a pipe dream because China cornered the market. Now that China has cornered the market and there's going to be a lot of incentive for made in America, maybe that's interesting. One of the more interesting to me um, and something that Vice President Kamala Harris was really touting a year or two ago was that Nokia um, has agreed to build a, a, a factory in Pleasant Prairie itself, not just in Kenosha, to build you know, some of the parts that go into Nokia switches and all those other things in Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin. And they're getting lots of Buy America waivers and things like that and have worked closely with the American government to check all the boxes for those things. So it's not like, you know, these places like Kenosha, which became famous because they were part, part of the circulatory system of the American automobile manufacturing industry. Like that's not coming back. And if you you know, go do some basic research. You can find people bemoaning, oh, the loss of the towns and the jobs, and we're no longer manufacturing at a mass scale. It's all snap-on tools or Nokia this or blah, blah, blah. Um, but there is sort of a small renaissance happening in this part of the country, and it's small-scale manufacturing. But for instance, even, even though Kenosha has been in the news for all the wrong reasons, and aside from what my friend jokingly said about getting out as quick as I can, you don't feel that when you're driving around and when you're driving in, you don't feel that in Pleasant Prairie. Pleasant Prairie feels new and it feels like things are going on. Also has the largest rec center in the United States. Don't know if you knew that right on Lake Andrea up there. So all sorts of interesting um, um, factoids. And also it goes back to our conversation last week about there being sort of in the DNA of towns and places like that, an ability to adapt. And, and this is where Orson Welles actually becomes relevant because I didn't know this. Obviously, I had to research it. Orson Welles' father, um, who he had a complicated relationship. We don't have to go into it, uh, worked for like a bike manufacturer 
in this part of the country. Like he made tools for bikes and things like that. And that Chrysler plant that was closed down to so much controversy in the late 1980s was originally a bicycle manufacturing plant. So they go from bicycles to automobiles. And now um, they're trying to turn the Chrysler plant into the Kenosha Innovation neighborhood, trying to make it a little lab for research and semiconductors and tech and all the buzzwords that you're thinking about, which you know, maybe pie in the sky. It's also not what most towns and cities are doing. Most towns and cities are talking about that. They're not having city council meetings and, you know, proposing bonds and allocating resources to actually building those things. Um, so I don't, I think Snap-on might have some competition if they continue to do things that way in this part of the country is what I'm trying to say. I think there's selection bias here too, because you, you end up in these pretty dynamic places in the Midwest but I think by definition, the kinds of places that are going to have companies that are going to bring Jacob Shapiro in to talk about geopolitics <laughs> are going to be the success stories, not the not the opposite, right? I guess that's true. I also tend to try and give every chance uh, or give every place that I go to a chance. Like I, I try to fall in love with every single place I go. Um but I mean, it's not it's not the same. It, it, like I'll be doing a lot more traveling um, as the course of this year goes on. And it'll be interesting to see at the end of the year, was I unabashedly positive about every single place I went, in which case it's either selection bias or uh, I'm a little too gullible. Or if I do get to places where I'm like, this place sucks, it's an absolute shithole. And I can't think of one right now, but that's also just because I've been traveling uh, so much and all over the place. Ironically, that my least favorite trip so far of this year was not to Minot, North Dakota in January and is not to Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin. Now it was Miami because there is something about Miami that just makes my skin crawl. But this is not my my therapy session. So maybe we should get into the geopolitics. Um, Rob, we, we alluded to it last week. And um, it's actually the subject of what I'm talking about. Um, today, later, with a with a client, they asked specifically for me to talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Only the second time in my entire career where someone has asked me to talk just about the geopolitics of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, which is interesting in and of its own right. Um, but why don't we just start? Let's. I mean, we might not even get through it with forty five minutes, but let's talk a little bit about the Middle East. There's a lot going on, even just this week. So. There were rumors of a ceasefire agreement between Israel and Hamas. Joe Biden even volunteered that he was optimistic by maybe next Monday there would be a ceasefire. Hamas came out and said, eh, not so fast, Joe. And Israel came out and said, well, we're still going to invade Rafah. Don't you worry. Maybe we'll delay a little bit, but we might still invade. So I don't know. The signals are not so clear yet. Um, I will say, so Ramadan starts around or on March 10th. And a lot of pressure is being built up both by the media, but also by Qatar, who's, who's running some of these negotiations in Israel and Hamas to get something done before Ramadan. And I think that's a little bit artificial. Maybe it's a negotiating tactic. I, I don't think the whole region is going to explode just because of Ramadan on March 10th. But you can, you can feel that there's this pressure to, okay, there's an opportunity here for compromise. Let's get a deal done, or at least some kind of ceasefire in place before March 10th. So that's what's going on in the conflict itself. Over in the Red Sea with our our Houthi friends in Yemen, they started the week by going after submarine cables, which is sort of the stuff of black swan nightmares. Now, they damaged a few. It's going to take probably six to eight weeks to repair them. But because of the redundancy of the cables and things like that, it has not caused that many problems. It really hasn't caused any problems globally. Um, but it is really the first instance I can think of of a state actor or a pro state, you know, proxy for a state actor. So the Houthis being a proxy of Iran going after submarine cables to create leverage and things like that. That's sort of a really interesting bit. At the same time, the Houthis came out and said if there was a ceasefire, maybe they would pull back. Maybe they would stop bombing things in general. The takeaway to there is just they're still bombing shit. The United States, the much vaunted United States Navy with nine aircraft carriers and all these bombs and everything else can't stop the Houthis from bombing submarine cables. It continues to be an astounding fact. Um, Iran enriched a little bit less uranium at 60% than it did recently. And the IEA, the IAEA says not to get too excited about this, that it's just the normal oscillation of nuclear production, but maybe a little tiny signal of something changing in Iran. Maybe not. Maybe it's just they're getting better at, <laughs> at creating even higher uh, percentage uranium and they're going to have nuclear weapons soon. And we're going to be talking about nuclear proliferation in the Middle East. Um, and then the sort of last but not least, we talked, we have been talking now for each about Egypt for weeks and what a basket case Egypt has become. Uh, it's the United Arab Emirates turn apparently to bail them out. They came out, unveiled a $35 billion um, 
scheme, I don't know what you want to call it, combination of investments and credits and grants and everything else um, to stave off disaster for Egypt, which probably means yet another currency devaluation is coming. Um, once they devalue the currency, I think it's for the fourth time in some ridiculous period, 12 or 18 months or something like that, they get access to IMF funds, maybe more dollars come in. Um, but Egypt looks too big to fail. Um, and their rich Sunni Gulf allies seem not willing to let them go at least completely down the toilet bowl quite yet. So that's just, and I haven't even mentioned Turkey. It's actually a fairly quiet week for Turkey. So we'll leave them to the side so that we don't completely overwhelm the listeners, but pick at whatever part of that you want to go into first, Rob. Let's start with um, Israel, uh, uh, Palestine, if you don't mind. So just a quick question, um, and maybe this is unanswerable. I know uh, Joe Biden was perceived to have had not great results from the Michigan primaries and that there was a protest vote within Democratic uh, circles against, you know, the administration's um, stance toward the conflict. Do you, does that have any impact on what they're doing? Does it spur them to try to get this resolved sooner than otherwise? Or should we just ignore this when we think about these issues? That's a good question. It, it might, in my opinion, because this is more U.S. domestic politics, and I'm not quite as, I'm, I wouldn't call myself an expert on this, although I've, I've, I know enough to be dangerous. In my opinion, if there was a Republican alternative that was willing to be tougher on Israel, and that has happened before, that might sound strange, but George uh, George. Bush the first um, was actually maybe the toughest U.S. president on Israel since Dwight Eisenhower. So there is some history of the Republicans being tough on Israel or giving Israel the tough love. If you had a Republican candidate who was offering that kind of tough love to Israel, then yes, you might actually think that there was a serious chance that a demographic of voters that usually went Democrat or that went with Biden last time would switch. The problem for those voters is Trump would be worse. Trump wanted to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Trump would just give the Israelis carte blanche. He doesn't care about any of these other things. And he wants you know Israel to do whatever it wants. Um, so I think the biggest impact that it could have is that people will stay home. And I am not sure that that does enough um, for the Biden administration to let that tail wag the dog. Now, I'm sure they're aware of it. Um, and I'm sure that there's lots of, you know, and if you look at the broader national polls nationally, um, approval ratings for how Biden has handled Israel are fairly low. But again, there's not a whole lot of differentiation there between Biden and Trump. So if Trump starts going out there and talking about how he's going to be tough on the Israelis and everything else, maybe we can have a conversation in that direction. But if that is the issue that is moving you at the ballot box, um, you're either not going to go to the ballot box or you're going to hold your nose and say, okay, well, at least Biden has been putting pressure on Israel to to stop a little bit, or at least to moderate their attacks. Not nearly enough from that perspective, if you hold that view. Um, but the alternative is not better here. And given where the status of things is now in, in Israel, uh, Gaza, I mean, how is this impacting everything else? So if you were asked to give a speech about this today, focused on this topic. Why does this client care and why should we care beyond just the, you know, the human level story of what's happening on the ground? What are the broader implications, if any, or, or is it just, Hey, this is a sad story and that's, that's it. I have never understood the level of interest and coverage that this particular conflict gets. We'll say, if you look at a map, there's a reason that what is today Israel, what was before Palestine, um, and then before that was you know various kingdoms and things like that. It has changed hands many times over history. So one of my favorite chart uh, or maps in the deck that I'm I'm showing later today is I show just six or seven of the empires that have overrun this part of the world. And if you look at a map, it sort of makes sense because if you're a European power and you're trying to project power into Asia, so whether you're the Romans or Alexander the Great or whoever else, um, you need the land bridge through the Middle East into Asia and. Palestine slash Israel is the first place where you land. You sort of have to have control of that territory if you're going to expand um, additionally. If you're the Egyptian pharaohs, by the way, and you're trying to expand beyond the Nile into the Levant, where's the first place you get? Palestine slash Israel. You need that territory if you're going to move up 
and try and make a play for the Euphrates, the Tigris, those other places. The same is true if you are an Eastern power that is looking West. So whether it's the Babylonians, whether it's the Islamic caliphates, whether it's Persian empires, um, getting to Israel slash Palestine was what gave you access to the Mediterranean. And then you can start thinking about the Bosphorus and North Africa and other things like that. So it is a really critical strategic spot. Um, there's also, um, you know, there are so many religious overtones and connotations to Israel, and it is also so directly connected to World War II, which is the historical moment that still dominates everyone's consciousness that I think people care about it um, from that point of view. And when I give talks about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, or when I talk about it, um, I spend most of my time just trying to explain the literally centuries of history that got us to this point, because there's so many different conflicting narratives. So just in pulling out those threads, like I, I usually say to my audiences, I'm not going to tell you what to think. I don't think anybody has the moral high ground here. And if they do, I'm not qualified to figure it out. What I can tell you is what both sides think and what the history is. And you can sort of make up your own mind. Um, but then once I do that part, I zoom back out and say, okay, and let's look at the broader Middle East right now. Let's look, for example, at the fact that the Houthis are bombing infrastructure in the Red Sea and that 90% of container shipping is not going through the Suez Canal because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Let's look at the fact that the Middle East used to have, and especially the Gulf, used to have a really tight relationship with the United States because the United States had to import oil from that part of the world. Decades of U.S. foreign policy and grand strategy are about securing those oil resources. That's not true anymore. The U.S. doesn't have to import anything from the Gulf if it doesn't want to. The countries that are the biggest importers of this Middle East oil are China and Japan and South Korea and India. And so you have this weird aberration, uh, what, what's the word? This weird anachronism of U.S. policy in the region where U.S. interests are not here anymore, even though they were since 1973. From 1973 until 2014, 15, this is the most important part of the world for U.S. foreign policy, full stop. It, it's not anymore. And it's not even that it's less important. It's not important in the grand scheme of things. The Pacific, what's going on, all that is much more important. And I think people have not quite caught up to that fact. And the region has not quite up, caught up to that fact. Still looking to the United States to pressure Israel to do things or to have defense treaties with them. While meanwhile, their top customers are India or China, who are running around with money and investments and trying desperately not to get tangled up in all of the political melodrama, but just making sure they have access to their oil and to their LNG and things like that. So th those are some of my best guesses. But I confess, as somebody who thinks about the world often, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's a compelling story. It's a depressing story. There are lots of compelling, dis depressing stories out there. Um, and when you look just in terms of the numbers of people that are affected, um, like there are other conflicts happening that affect more people. And yet this conflict still captures the imagination for most people in a way that a lot of other conflicts don't. So, And how do the Europeans fit into all this? Because we always talk about the United States in relation to the Middle East and, you know, that historic area of interest. But when you look at a ship that goes through the Suez Canal, for instance, it's not going to the U.S., it's going to Antwerp or it's going to Rotterdam uh, or Genoa. The, Don't forget Genoa or, or Genoa and the submarine cables that are being, you know, attacked aren't going to the U S East coast necessarily. They're going into Southern Europe and the energy flows out of North Africa into, you know, the other parts of the world are not going to the U S they're going to Italy and into Spain and you're talking about, you know, hydrogen pipelines going from North Africa into Southern Europe and beyond. Where are the Europeans in all this? And how do you see, if at all, that their role becomes bigger and more active as the U.S. sort of withdraws? Well, first of all, this is a little tongue in cheek, but only a little. If you want to blame someone for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and for a lot of the things going on in the Middle East, blame the Europeans because it is their fault. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict itself, we can blame that directly on the British. And it goes back to World War I. In the context of World War I, they promise, and this is where T.E. Lawrence and Lawrence of Arabia comes up, they promise the same land to two different groups. They promise this land to the Arab groups if they will rise up against the Ottoman Empire, part of the central powers in World War I. And then they also promise the land to the Jews for a national homeland. And 
ultimately, what is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Two different groups that are fighting over the same land and don't want to share it. And that situation is created, number one, by the British promising the land to both sides. And then number two, by Nazi Germany and by the destruction of European Jewry, which is the thing that actually makes Jews want to leave Europe. Um, if you look at the migration numbers from Europe to Palestine, and what would eventually become Israel, they're still relatively low even into the 1930s. And by relatively low, I mean in the tens of thousands. This is maybe 5%, 10% Jewish population in some of these areas. It is only the combination of you've given the, the, the Jews the idea of a national homeland, and then you've killed 6 million of them, and then they're running to the only place where they can feel safe. And then suddenly they meet a population that is already there in land that they thought was promised to them and which they didn't own because it was owned by the Ottomans and the Jews started borrowing from them. So the Europeans, like a lot of blame can be laid at their feet for this situation. And even as recently, you know, we had Helen Thompson on and she was talking about the Sinai campaign in 1956. As recently as, you know, the late 1950s, the Europeans hadn't given up the idea that they were still the shot callers here. The 1956 Sinai campaign is France and Britain teaming up with Israel to take over the Suez Canal from Nasser's government in Egypt at the time. Can you imagine that happening today? But that's what happened in the late 1950s because these European powers were pushing Israel that way. I think it's also important here to note that the U.S.-Israel special relationship, uh, it doesn't start really until 1967, or I would really date it in 1973. And that's in the context of the Cold War. All of these secular Arab dictators start batting their eyelashes at the Soviet Union. And the United States doesn't like that. And so the United States doubles down on its relationships with Turkey, with Israel, with Iran until that blows up in the United States's face because they back the Shah. And that's a whole nother podcast that we would have to do. Um, and the reason I'm telling you that is because in the 1950s and early 1960s, the only reason Israel exists and survives the war of independence and everything else is because the Europeans are the ones that are supporting them. Um, Israel's nuclear tech does not come from the United States. It comes from France. France was trying to support uh, Israel in the Middle East for its own ends um, in general. So that's some of the historical background. Today, Europe is pretty weak. Um, and it doesn't even have you know enough weapons and resources to send to Ukraine in its fight against Russia, let alone pretending like it's still the heyday of Euro European power in this part of the world. And a great example of this that was proven out was Libya. The Europeans were the ones who were chomping at the bit to get rid of Muammar Gaddafi in the context of the Arab Spring. And it was the United States that had to come in and clean up the mess because it became very clear that the Europeans did not have the, the requisite military capabilities or the will um, to actually finish the job in Libya. And Libya is still in a state of civil war because the Europeans started it. And then the United States came in and half-assed cleaning it up. And now the sides are just fighting each other and everything's terrible. Um, all of which is to say, when you hear Emmanuel Macron droning on about how we need European defense forces, we need European military capability, we need to be able to protect European sovereignty, you're exactly right, Emmanuel. Europe needs military forces because the United States is not going to protect Europe's interests in the Middle East you know, sort of interminably. And the Asian powers that I mentioned, they have some interest in making sure that the sea lanes are open, but they've also just proven they can go around Africa. They care about getting the oil and the LNG and those resources for themselves at more preferential terms. Um, so Europe is really, they're on the outside looking in here. They don't have a whole lot that they can say. They don't have political influence because they are the cause of the problem. They don't have military influence because they don't have uh, military forces that are on the ground in this part of the world. Um, so yeah, it, it's an area where Europe is extremely exposed and absent the United States' willingness to help out can't really do much, which is one of the many, many reasons that if you're a European leader, you are terrified of another Trump administration because Biden still thinks about the Middle East like a 19, 1990s US Democrat. You can see that in everything that he's doing and saying and pushing for. So he still is in the anachronism of, oh, the Middle East is still important. I'm going to commit US blood and treasure to making sure that all these things continue to go in this direction. I am not sure that Trump would do that. In fact, I'm pretty sure Trump would try and say, hey, it's the Israelis and the Saudis problem. Let's give them everything they need. Nuclear weapons, this, that, and the other thing. We can't send Toby Keith there anymore. RIP Toby Keith passed away recently. Really sad. But we'll send some other US country artist over there and they can play songs for Mohammed bin Salman and everything will be great. Like, um, And then we're going to focus on China and also on trade wars with Europe itself. So um, not a really great position to be in if you're Europe. And if you're looking for someone to really blame in this conflict, blame the Europeans. It's their fault. So here's sort of a provocative question by design. 
if we're heading into a truly multipolar world, as you've sort of argued very persuasively, and the incentive of you know right thinking people is that that world should be as durable and safe as possible, which means in part that Europe needs to step up and and be a player and secure some of these areas where the U.S. is not going to play that role anymore. Should we be sort of perversely rooting for a Donald Trump victory and the potential catalyst that could be uh, for strictly, you know, through the prism of what Europe is going to do or how they're going to react to things? Um, that's a tough, that's a tough question. And it's hard to, um, you know, abstract from all of the domestic political issues too. But if you are someone who is who is hoping that an external shock will lead the Europeans to changing the way that they do things? Um, yes, you can answer your question in the affirmative. The The problem is that we've sort of already seen this movie, like the COVID-19 pandemic. Oh, it, it, you know, the Europeans decided to borrow together joint debt. That was a big Rubicon cross, but, you know, still a lot of squabbling, Hungary and Poland. They still haven't allocated a lot of the money. Um, then Russia invades Ukraine. Well, the Europeans are still pussyfooting around about what should we do and what should we provide? And is Ukraine going to be part of the EU? And is there going to be a negotiation, et cetera? Um, the point being, I think we've seen the external shock hypothesis and it hasn't moved the Europeans to doing anything. If the Europeans are actually going to come around, I think it has to come from them internally. So I don't think like Trump might pour some more wood on the fire. He might make it more, he might make the argument better for someone like Macron. Um, but unless it comes from a place of sort of positive, this is what the EU is going to be. This is why the EU is going to do this. This is why these national leaders are going to do this. I don't think Trump is going to be the one that moves them in that direction. I think the counterfactual is if Europe does not find that resolve within itself, maybe the European Union will still exist. But in, in a sort of delicious, ironic twist of history, Europe will go from being the colonizer to in some sense, the colonized and different European states will be on different sides of this multipolar world. Some will align with China and some might align even with Russia and some will align with the United States and some will try and do their own thing. And it'll be sort of a hodgepodge checkerboard the way that Europe was before sort of the 1700s, which is a scary thought. You probably know from your own knowledge of history and your readings of Oliver Cromwell and everything else, how violent and terrible a place Europe was in the 1500s and the 1600s when they were all squabbling with each other and before they figured these things out, not to mention World Wars One and World War II uh, brought to us by the Europeans. So I, I, I hear you, but I, I, don't, I don't think that if, if what you're rooting for is the Europeans to find themselves, we've seen the external shock scenario and it didn't work. Something else is going to have to happen for the Europeans to turn around, I think. I think it's a really interesting question to think about. Um, have you ever read The Pity of War by Niall Ferguson? Not, I have not read that Ferguson book, but I've read plenty of, of Ferguson. Um, he has a pretty provocative thesis in it where he basically says that World War II could have been avoided because ultimately, you know, once Germany uh, united and once Germany, you know, achieved the power that it did, it was destined to be sort of the dominant player in a European customs union, as he describes it, and that ultimately everything between you know basically 1900 and 1950 was the the bad way of getting to that end destination and if you could have you know done that in an eu type structure that you would have eventually gotten the same thing and i, I think that's that's really interesting because if that is the case and and germany was always destined to play that role and destined to do so in a way where you know, there's sort of a balance within Europe itself, but sort of a weak balance. Like what happens when Europe has to be something different? Um, and I guess uh, I'm, I'm sort of rambling, but like the notion that Europe can just be sort of this level playing field and sort of just be an entity that stands above everything and just maintains these rules that everyone has to follow, which is sort of the German conception of Europe as this arbiter rather than a actor. That's sort of where we are today. Is it possible to turn Europe into an actor 
and and can you do so in a way that is not falling back on nationalisms and and can trans transcend them uh or is that just not is that just not possible you know and like just one one final thought um I was thinking about this recently because if you really look at the history of France, it's interesting. Um, France is a very centralized nation, and it's a very um, interventionist nation. There's actually a great book called uh, The Euro and the Battle of Ideas, um, which was written about a decade ago, I think. And it goes into detail about sort of the different conceptions of what Europe and the EU should be and, and between the French side and the German side and sort of philosophically how they see things differently. And um, what I'm getting at is if you look at the history of France, um, France itself is a, is a patchwork of nations where basically a centralized authority came in and squashed them and said, you're one nation now and we're going to act in unison and we're going to have these things that define us that are common. But at the same time, we're going to make a big deal about celebrating. Oh, you're the Britain, you're the you know from Brittany, and you're from from Provence, and you're from the West, and here's all the wonderful things that make you unique in this patchwork quilt of different languages. But it's sort of fake. And I wonder, is that the history, or is that the future of Europe that you need to see, where you have some sort of very muscular power of some kind in the center that comes in and says, okay, like for our own security we need to we need to implement these changes and we need to exert power in a very centralized way but we'll still oh the germans oh look at how unique you are and that's great oh and the czechs and the italians but it, ultimately they're under the thumb of something in the center if that makes sense yeah i mean france is is really interesting and y yes they celebrate some of those subnational identities i i dare say they wouldn't celebrate the Algerians or anything else. And there was also a big controversy in the early 1800s about the role of the Jews in France, if you can imagine that. And um, the key takeaway was basically to the Jews, nothing is a nation, but everything is individuals. The idea being you can celebrate and do whatever you want in private, but when you are in the public space, you are French. And there's really no, so like we can talk about the celebration of the subnational stuff, but I don't know, my, my impression of that is that um, it's not something to be celebrated in person. Also, just a random aside, I was reading, um, in the economist this week there was an article about germany's industrial complex which everybody says is shrinking and melting away and it was talking about how the ruhr actually uh, and this dovetails with what we started the podcast with it sounds a little bit like uh wisconsin in the sense that actually there's a lot of interesting small manufacturing things happening and a lot of the expertise there is starting to turn around there are northern parts of the ruhr that are still based on coal um, and that part of the the Ruhr, which is sort of the German industrial heartland, is not doing well. But the southern parts, like tech acceleration and all these kind of weird investment schemes and companies that are building really complicated things. Now, they're dependent on global supply chains. But, you know, uh, some interesting signs that German, quote unquote, industrialization continues to be. Um, I mean, it's going to be here in the short term. We've talked about this and published research about this, but I wouldn't bet against the Germans if you're on a five, 10 year time horizon. Look, the answer to your question about the EU is, of course, it's possible, but it's going to be tremendously difficult. And it's going to be tremendously difficult because the two countries that can do that are Germany and France. Number one, they don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. Number two, to your point, the Germans are um, in some ways passive and afraid of their own history. They're, they're not willing to assert things that way because the historical memory of what Germany did in the past weighs really heavy on them, which then leads France to be the instigator. And that's all well and good. But the problem with that is if you look at the polls, France is arguably the most Eurosceptic country in the entire bloc. Um, and, you know, Macron is is just about termed out. Like we're, we're already starting to hear about Le Pen or the far right or about Euroscepticism rising in France. And I take it more seriously than I do in some of the other countries because, I mean, just look at the latest Eurobarometer data. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it was something like 50-50 of people who approve of the EU who are, who don't approve of the EU. And France has always had this sort of independent streak in and of itself. So I think what you're talking about is possible. And France... And there are actors in both France and Germany that are certainly pushing for it. But for it to happen, France and Germany have to be on the same page. 
uh, and they have to be willing to upset the apple cart and make some European nations mad or even kick them out or create some kind of structure within the EU itself that allows them to say, okay, like we're not going to have countries like Hungary that are going to be able to gum up the works and things like that. And it's just, it's going to be very difficult. Um, the, the metaphor I think to use is how long did it take the, the U S colonies as they were breaking away from the British empire to form their own constitution in their own state? It took years, if not decades. And even in the early goings, like it was not, it didn't go particularly well. It eventually had a civil war because of some of the things that were left undone, um, at the beginning. So this is not a process that usually happens quickly. And the problem, the biggest problem for Europe is they're running out of time. Um, because the world is changing around them and they don't arguably have 15 years to figure this out. They just need to start making moves now, I think, if they're going to stay as relevant as they are in terms of their current power and influence in the world. And and that's that's a tough slog. It's why this year is so critical, because you do have French and German officials who are talking about the treaty changes that have to happen to make this work. There is some swell on both sides um, to try and get something done, but it always seems to end with squabbles over things that probably aren't that important in the long run and then nothing gets done and then you look at who's getting elected or what elections are coming down the line and and you get that much more depressed about the situation so i, I can go either way it's it's possible but it's going to be very hard i guess the only counterfactual to the colonies comparison is they weren't surrounded by potential threats right so ideally you would have some sort of I mean, we, we talked about the the threat, you know, catalyzing change thesis and how that has not really played out. But if it plays out like you described earlier, where Europe is sort of fragmented, different countries are aligning with different outside powers, you know, North Africa is is chaotic, you know, there's there's real impacts on people's day to day livelihoods that you would think might spur someone to step up and and put the niceties aside and try to force their way into a position of leadership. There was external threat in the colonies. There were Native American tribes and there were the British and there were the French running around and the Spanish were there too. I mean, Santa Ana uh, (laughs) almost made it to New Orleans when he was marching uh, before the whole thing blew up in his face. Um, But, you know, the, the real... The real struggle here is one of identity, and this is sort of the, the most interesting question, in some ways the most important, and the one that is least, which we have the least amount of hard science, if you will, to rely on. And it goes down to things like, is a Taiwanese national identity going to rise, or is Taiwan just going to be complacent? Is a European identity going to displace um, allegiances to nationalisms that really don't work anymore if you want some of these European countries to maintain their current space. Um, There are absolutely uh, citizens of European states in Europe who feel more European than anything else, who have bought into the ideals of the European Union. The problem is they're the minority. And the question really is, can you get enough Europeans um, to think that way, to put European first and then to put their national identity second? And uh, that's a really hard thing for all of these different countries to do. You, you mentioned France, like France did this to all the little groups that are within France today. If France wants to see this glittering future, they're going to have to give up the idea that it's going to be France that is leading it. And they're just going to be one of the, one of the squashed, <laughs> like they're going to be one of the ancillary groups that get celebrated, but we, really we're all European. I think one of the problems with Macron is he wants to have his croissant and eat it too. Ha ha. He wants to have oh, France is a leader and I'm a Gaullist and we're doing all these great things. And by the way, Europe is the super strong superpower. All right, like put your money where your mouth is, like put Europe first. Nobody is actually putting, maybe that's a little strong, but I find find that most of these leaders are not putting Europe first. And that makes sense. These are democracies. If you put Europe first, you're not going to win democratic elections. Yeah. I wonder how much of that is is built into the current views of the right in the sense of like people talk about the far right and nationalism per se, right? But I think in many ways, at least in the French context, which is the only one that I know particularly well, that that view is not necessarily yay, rah, rah, France. It's we don't want people in our country who have fundamentally different values from what we're used to. You don't see them complaining about the Polish plumbers. They're complaining about people from Africa and from the Middle East. And because 
values are meaningfully different. So maybe, maybe you know, I'm trying to be turn this on its head a little bit. Maybe you know, kind of the rise of the far right in some weird way helps solidify a European identity because it's identifying a distinct other against which you're defining your own group. And maybe that group isn't Frenchmen or Germans, you know, with the with the German right. Maybe it's, hey, these people are these people are very different. And like, yeah, those guys are they eat sausages and they speak a different language, but at least we can sort of get them. Yeah, I mean, a shiver goes down my spine when we start talking about how the Europeans are going to identify the other within their own society. Like, again, a movie that I've already seen and don't care to see again. And by the way, I think you're right about France from that point of view. I was in Britain in what, studying at Oxford in, was it 2014, 15, 13? I can't remember now which year it was, somewhere around then. And they absolutely were complaining about the Polish plumbers. They wanted nothing to do with the Polish plumbers. So uh, maybe the Brits are just, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, we only have a few more minutes. Let's talk about Egypt for a second, because I think Egypt is interesting. I know you looked a little bit at what the UA UAE promised them. Um, and, you know, in some sense, Cairo is still... It's still the weather vane. It's where the Arab Spring started. It's where sort of the Arab nationalist movement started with Nasser. We alluded to that in the 1950s. So um, what are you seeing out of Egypt after looking at it a bit closer? The thing that catches my eye is, you know, you see the headline about the UAE is basically giving them $35 billion. That's not Trump change. You know, you sort of see this on the newswire and you're like, oh, yeah, well, sure, billions. Like it sort of goes over your head. According to the numbers, the UAE's total GDP is 410 or so billion dollars. So we're talking about eight and a half percent of the UAE's GDP. And they're providing it to Egypt, from what I can see, largely in exchange for the development rights of a large piece of of you know of land, very desirable land on the Mediterranean coast that they're going to turn into basically an investment hub and a destination, you know, development, much like they've done with the, with the Palm cities and sort of those flagship projects in the UAE. I, I find this very interesting. And I actually was talking to chat GBT before we got on and asking, <laughs> you know, can you think of any historical parallels chat GBT where you have a very small, very rich country, basically trying to build influence through this kind of, huge investment. And there were no examples, really. The only examples that could come up with were Singapore and Norway, who have obviously enormous sovereign wealth funds, but they're not doing this. They're not using those sovereign wealth funds in this very direct and targeted manner. And I, I, I think the jury is still out on how successful this sort of thing will be, but it's it's something new um, and it's, uh, it's worth really focusing on more than, you know, oh, they're getting a bailout from the IMF. They're getting a bailout from here. This is real money. And this is a big, a big deal, I think. Um, well, this is great. Cause I'm going to feel, I'm going to feel smarter than chat GPT here because there are absolutely answers to that question. And the first thing that comes to my mind is the Phoenicians based entire Lebanon uh, or, you know, present day Lebanon who have all these outposts and city states all along the Mediterranean from like what the ninth to sixth century or something like this. My, my old history of the region is, is coming, is coming to four. I think you could also very well make the case that this is what the British empire did on a certain level. It's not like the British empire went and conquered all of these different places by force. They just had better technology. So they could send, you know, a, an abysmally small number of people and set up a trading company in a place like India and you know their model went forward and they took it over the the interesting thing i think that you're talking about is i think that in the context of a more multipolar world there is a place for city states which is what the uae ultimately is and what the gulf a lot of what these gulf countries absolutely are and you can have these little networks of city states that are all around and maybe you can create a satellite city state that has more in common with what yours does and you can be the merchants of a particular region and and things like that. So yeah, I, I think it, there that, is that's a little bit, story. not to interrupt, but that's a little bit different because this is a, I don't want to use the word white elephant, but these guys mm -hmm. are building a fucking seaside resort. Like yeah. this is not, you know, the Venetian empire with, you know, it's one street that's devoted solely to Venetian merchants and you can't tax them and they get all these privileges. Like 
those guys were installing nodes in a merchant network that were demonstrated to be profitable from the very second you put them up. And the Phoenicians, I think, were similar because they were traders, right? Like this is, we're going to come in. It would be like, I don't know. It would be like if in the 1980s when Japan was riding high, if instead of buying Carnegie Hall, they went and they spent $40 billion to like build Disney World in Florida. Um, like that's, it's just, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's much more speculative. It's much more different. And maybe that's just the world we live in now where you build these things and you can just build a Dubai wherever you want and people will come. And, um, but this is a, it's a, it's a fundamentally unique thing in, in the, in the sense of what kind of investment it is, I guess. That's what I'm saying. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't shortchange what the Phoenicians were doing in that way. Like they didn't have any of the tech that we have and they decide they're going to send, uh, you know, merchants over to to what is today Tunisia and set up a little colony there. And it eventually becomes Carthage, um, which, again, is, is the same sort of thing. Like you have a power that is in the Levant or deep in the heart of the Middle East that then wants to establish some kind of outpost on the Mediterranean. So, I mean. I guess it depends where this is. Like if it's a boondoggle, like in the Egyptian desert, like, okay, like now I'm, but like the UAE has proven that they can do this. And that if you put this sort of resort town on an important coast or on an important trading route or something like that, things will go well. And if you can figure out how to get water and how to get resources, I mean, Egypt, there's a reason that Egypt has been many times throughout history, such a powerful force. Um, its own mismanagement and a lot of other things have driven it sort of into the ground. But it, it makes sense to me if, if the UAE can prove that this model works in the Gulf, well, maybe get out of the Gulf, which is really geopolitically charged and get over to the Mediterranean, which is also politically charged, but it's nothing like the Gulf and with Iran and Saudi Arabia and everybody else um, holding holding that over your head. So it, to me, the, the metaphor works, but I'm also just now like trying to get into a fight with ChatGPT to prove my... <laughs> my human virtues over here. Well, it's worth watching no matter what, because it's certainly an interesting development. And I, I, I wonder just extrapolating in a broader way, like are we seeing the beginning of states becoming weak and other states coming in and, and essentially, I don't want to use the word colonizing, but you know, your British empire comparison was, was, was somewhat apt. Um, like, are we going to see Mark Zuckerberg come in and, and, you know, I mean, he already owns half of Hawaii. Right. So, uh, I, I don't know, maybe that's, that's too sci-fi and maybe that's extrapolating way too far, but that's why I'm, this no, piques my I, interest beyond the, but I, I, the I think, I think we're seeing it yeah. like what China's doing in Pakistan. Um, this little project that you're talking about here, like there are definite exa examples of this, the, the difference between, now and then, and this is, I've, I've been struggling with what to call this. My working term now is imperialism 2.0. But um, the thing that made imperialism work in the 1800s and 1900s was European technology was so far advanced from the places that they were colonizing that it, it wasn't just political weakness and division. It was, they had, you know, it was guns versus arrows. It was, you know, ships and artillery versus like a little raft or something like that. Um, that's not going to be true for China and Pakistan, as China has learned. It's not going to be true for the UAE and Egypt. Like they don't have some kind of technological advantage that makes them so much more powerful than the Egyptians. What they have is some money. And like eventually, like the Egyptians are going to come in and probably like it'll be corrupt and army officers will get kickbacks and they'll be the ones that live there and it won't actually do anything. Like the UAE in some ways is just writing a blank check to a nation with serious structural problems. And if you don't fix the structural problems, or if you aren't so omnipotent compared to them on a power perspective that you can just force them to do what you want, um, probably the investment's not going to go so well. So maybe one of these countries will figure out how to use AI or, you know, some biotech application or, or energy solution or something like that, that gives them that kind of political leverage. But if, if I'm thinking about the UAE right now, or even the Gulf, like they've invested in Egypt before. They've invested in Pakistan themselves before. It always goes nowhere because Egypt is a country of 125 million plus people run by a military dictatorship that siphons off the money so that the military officers can continue to have a good life. Like as long as that's Egypt, I don't care how, how nice your city is on the Mediterranean. It's probably not going to do very well.
Yeah. Oh, I took his breath. I'm, I'm spicy today. You can feel it. It's because I'm revving up for this for this speaking engagement. But it, it, it does kind of worry me. Like the Gulf is spending, like, like I didn't realize that the UAE was putting so much money into this thing. I mean, eight plus percent of GDP is, is absolutely huge. Like I don't, what return exactly do they think they're going to get? Like, uh, I don't know that, 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 that seems like a dangerous rabbit hole to go, to go down. And for what, like is, is Egypt going to come to the UAE's aid if something happens with Iran? Is, are we going to go back to the Egyptian dreams of the 1960s and have some kind of unified Arab state where all these Arab states are now working in conjunction with each other? I don't know. I mean, that, that starts to get interesting. And if the Sunni Arabs want to resist Turkish power and Iranian power and, you know, the Asian powers that I talked about that are interested, like they are going to have to pool resources. So I don't know, I'm spitballing, but it seems like a doubtful investment from my point of view. No, I agree. I think that's why the comparisons to Singapore and Norway are so interesting because those are two unequivocal success stories. And, you know, not like Norway is going to be swinging around its political, uh, you know, powers in the in Scandinavia or something. But um, both have taken the route of broadly diversified uh, investments that are essentially just buying the market and have done very well. Um, whereas here you're starting to see, and maybe this is a misread of the situation, but it's hard not to see sort of one-upmanship being part of this, mm -hmm. not only between the UAE and Saudi, but also with Qatar and, and everything that they're doing. Um, to what extent is this sort of princes doing uh, prince things as opposed to a well thought out strategy, you know? You know what it kind of reminds me of? It kind of reminds me of when Scotland, before it was part of the, you know, before they united the kingdoms or whatever, they wanted a colony of their own. So this wasn't a diversified investment, but they pool a lot of Scotland's natural resources to build a colony um, near what is today the Panama Canal in the Darien Gap, which is not a great place to put a colony. So all of this treasure, it was some like ridiculous percentage of Scottish, Scottish GDP at the time goes towards building this colony in Darien. Um, and it just blows up in their face. They lose it all. They all die from disease, everything else. And it's actually one of the reasons that Scotland has to join with England because they are so broke after this failed venture, um, that the economic prospect of merging with England is the sort of elites of Scotland decide that that is worth, worth the trade-off. So it kind of reminds me of that. I mean, it's not quite as bad as trying to build a colony in the middle of a jungle where you don't have medicines and things like that. Like you can at least see the argument, oh, okay, Egyptian, Mediterranean, beach town, we can desalinize the water. Like I can sort of see like the direction we're going in, but uh, man, the UAE, the Scotland of the, of the, of the 2020s. I don't know. That's a good metaphor. It's probably the first time anyone's made that comparison. You know, that's what we do on the podcast, Rob. We, we bring see. people <laughs> different ideas. All right. I got to go get ready. Um, anything else you want to tell the listeners before we get out of here? No, we'll, we'll see you next week. We'll see you next week from Minneapolis. Get ready for my deep dive into Minneapolis, Minnesota. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur. Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor.